Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and today I'm reviewing the vaccine for the human papillomavirus. Now, that might not sound too, too fascinating, but believe me, it is. This is a story that involves sex, parts of your body we don't often talk about, human relationships, warts, our immune system, and unfortunately, cancer. So there will definitely be TMI here, but I, I think the better you understand something, the better your decision. And I say decision because the question I want to look at today is, should you or, or someone you care about get the HPV vaccine? So let's start with some background. Our story begins with the common wart. Now, most of us have had one on a finger or a foot, and warts are caused by a virus, what we call the human papillomavirus, or, or HPV for short. Now, we can get warts on any part of our body, including, and, and here comes the TMI part, our genitalia or our anus, and, and by genitalia, I mean the vagina in woman and the penis in men. The vagina also has different parts to it. So, for example, the front part, the vulva, or the part that's farther inside, the cervix. In the past, nobody thought much about warts. I mean, we knew we transferred warts to one another, and, and some people didn't like the way they looked. But in the last few decades, we have figured out that certain cancers, such as cervical, vaginal, vulvar, anal, penile, and even some throat cancers can be caused by HPV. For example, 99% of cervical cancer is caused by HPV, as well as approximately 90% of anal cancers and 35% and of penile cancers. What is not commonly known is that about 75% of sexually active people have HPV by the time they're 50. The good news is that most of the time, our bodies actually fight off HPV, just like any other virus, but about 10 to 20% of the time, the infection persists. The realization that most warts are harmless, but some warts or, or HPV can cause some types of cancer led to an aha moment. Researchers said, hey, if you can give vaccines for viruses like the flu or, or hepatitis, then maybe we can create a vaccine for HPV and save people from these cancers before they happen. And that's exactly what did happen. Today, there are two vaccines available for HPV. One is called Gardasil and the other is Cervarix. There happen to be over 100 different types of HPV viruses, but the two that cause 70% of cervical cancer are strains known as number 16 and number 18. Two other types, number 6 and number 11, cause about 90% of plain old non-cancerous genital warts. So not dangerous, but not exactly the highlight of your week. Gardasil protects against all four of these strains, so it protects against plain genital warts as well whereas Cervix focuses just on those that can cause cancer. Both vaccines require three separate shots that are administered over a period of six months. Vaccines for cancer, I mean, that's pretty cool, you gotta admit. The main target of these vaccines is to prevent cervical cancer in women, as it's the most prevalent of the cancers caused by HPV. In Canada, about one in 150 women develop cervical cancer, and about 423 women die from it every year. Worldwide, this translates to over a quarter of a million deaths a year. The best time to receive the HPV vaccine is before a person becomes sexually active, to prevent HPV infection before it happens. That is why school programs aim to vaccinate girls in grades 5 or 6 or 7 or 8, and, and because the peak risk for HPV is in the first 5 to 10 years of sexual experience, the window for receiving the vaccine continues to be open even after sexual activity begins. Now, I've been focusing on the experience of females, but there is an emerging research on whether males should receive the vaccine. Males are a major source of female infections and vice versa, so vaccinating young males would not only protect them against HPV, but would also prevent much of the infection in females. Males who have sex with males are at higher risk of anal cancer, and the HPV vaccine could protect them. Okay, so that's a backgrounder. The next question is, how effective are these vaccines? Well, I think it depends on how you define effective. When we look at the immune response, most trials show almost 100% effectiveness against the two viruses that cause 70% of cervical cancer. Ah, but what about the other 30% you might ask? And you would be right to ask. The vaccine does not prevent against all cervical cancer, which is exactly why women who do receive the vaccine still need to have regular pap tests. When we look beyond just immune response towards data on reducing actual rates of cervical and other cancers, we need to understand that it may take up to 20 years for HPV to produce cervical cancer. However, most HPV vaccination programs did not start till after 2007, which means we haven't had a lot of time to properly demonstrate an actual drop in disease. Early data, especially from Australia and the US, shows a reduction in the signs of early cancer as well as reduced rates of genital warts and reduced need for procedures to assess and treat cervical cancer, such as repeat pap smears, colposcopies, and biopsies. 
As well, for women that have already tested positive for HPV in the past, taking the vaccine actually helped reduce further HPV infection. So I suppose the next question is, what's the downside to getting the vaccine? Vaccine reporting systems, which collect adverse events and then analyze any worrisome patterns, have signaled possible neurological disease, blood clots, and even death. But when these serious events are analyzed by expert groups, they have showed no obvious clustering to suggest causality, meaning they most likely happen by chance or for some other reason. There is one exception, as one Australian review signaled a higher rate of anaphylaxis than we have typically seen, about 2.6 per 100,000 people vaccinated. Anaphylaxis can be treated, but it's a serious allergic reaction that leads to rash, throat swelling, and low blood pressure. This rate is extremely rare, but it's being followed up now. Another way to assess side effects is by following people during research trials. In the case of the HPV vaccine, this method shows that about 74% had some kind of reaction to the vaccine, but interestingly, so did 64% of people who got the placebo. So people had headaches, fever, nausea, but about the same rate whether they got the HPV or fake shot. The outcome that differed most between the two groups was mild to moderate injection site reactions. About two out of three people reported mild to moderate pain, redness, and swelling. These reactions, along with the occasional fainting, are pretty classic when we inject people as they are a downside to injectable vaccines in general. They usually disappear in two days. So far, after 10 years of clinical trials, there is no evidence that a booster dose will be necessary. Okay, let's just recap. First of all, let's face it, it's kind of weird to be thinking about sex and warts and cancer, and, and I get that. But when you see people suffering from cancer like I do, and, and many of you have, and having the opportunity to actually prevent it in the first place, I think we have to overcome and get the discussion and the decision on the table. Second of all are the pros and cons. On the one hand, we know that the vaccine significantly reduces the risk of early markers of cervical cancer, as well as vaginal, vulvar, anal cancer, and, and also of genital warts. Obviously, preventing cancer is the priority, but I think it's also important to point out that when I see women and men, especially in the years when they often are negotiating new relationships, that having genital warts can be a very difficult problem. So preventing even non-cancerous genital warts certainly has value in my mind. On the other hand, we have a shot that hurts a bit, say in four or five people, that may cause some swelling and redness, say in one of four people, but usually just for a few days. There's the added drawback that you may have to get the shot three times, and we have a story that is not completely told, but we have a research system that is monitoring the use of the vaccine to see if there are other red flags we need to consider over time. Numbers help some people make decisions. The two contrasting numbers that stick out for me are significantly reducing your 1 in 150 chance of getting cervical cancer versus a 1 in about 40,000 chance of anaphylaxis. Other data sets put the anaphylaxis rates as, as rare as 1 in a million. Now, I hope this information can help you make the best decision about the HPV vaccine. It's tough to take a medication when you're healthy, but that is when we have the biggest opportunity to prevent illness before it happens. Ultimately, it's your choice and your call. Hope this helps.